Which I'm holding in my heart, the holy written word of God. The Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the word of God says I am. I can do what the word of God says I can do. I have what the word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, God's word is being confirmed in my life with signs following. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah and amen. Turn your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, I'm teaching on the book of 2 Corinthians chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And we're looking at the central theme from where the Apostle Paul began in chapter 1. I'll just kind of catch you up for those of you who are just now getting on to this instruction. Paul wrote this letter of 2 Corinthians so that the believers would not sorrow according to the fashion of the world. God wants you to have a different type of sorrow. The godly sorrow does not create damage in anything. The godly sorrow is not to be repented of because the godly sorrow causes you to repent in a wonderful way and to look for a great blessing from aligning yourself with the will of God. Godly sorrow only uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense of when I say, well, I'm crying because I'm really uh, aware of how God has corrected me. But he says that crying only lasts for a, a while. It's not something that you'll continually, you know, knee jerk to or have in your life because every time you think about the mistake you've made, you want to cry. God is like, no, that's not the way it is with godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is only going to last for a time that is necessary for you to align yourself, and then you're to move forward in the joy. Amen? So Christians should not be running around saying, I'm suffering or I'm having grief for the Lord. There should not be any professional mourners here in the body of Christ. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And because the joy of the Lord is your strength, you're supposed to be exhibiting that joy in all that you say and do. So in, in, uh, in Hebrews, I'm going to ask you to turn over to Hebrews and put a marker in uh, this particular verse of Scripture. In Hebrews, I want you to see something. In Hebrews chapter 12, put a marker there because he talks about correcting you, correcting the child of God. And the child of God that is to be a recipient of the correction of the Lord should understand that the motive of God's correction is always for your betterment. It's not to squash you, depress you, or cause you to be a person who is unhappy. God wants you to be blessed. Amen? And he wants the joy of the Lord to be obvious in your countenance. So, <clears throat> we have two places. Then we have 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is where we left off from last week. And then we have Hebrews chapter 12 that I've asked you to turn to. So, you have Hebrews marked? Good. Now, turn over to, keep it marked there, and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, and then we're going to come back to Hebrews chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And we'll look at verse 8. Verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry though it were but for a what? <laughs> but for a season. 
Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in what? In nothing. So godly sorrow does not produce damage at all. Godly sorrow doesn't take away. Godly sorrow adds to your life. So the worldly sorrow takes away. The worldly sorrow causes you to be just without joy. But godly sorrow causes you to repent and move to a higher level in the Lord. Verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh what? See how he says, the sorrow of the world worketh death. So God makes a distinction between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Verse 11. For behold this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this manner, or this matter. So Paul is explaining that their response to his instruction to them was a marvelous response. Why? Because they were willing to accept instruction. And the instruction that they took from him came from the Spirit of God. Verse 12. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might what? Yes. Might appear unto you. I am so hot in this hot sweater. I had asked for some air to be turned on. Is it on? If not, I'm going to have to just wear a different type of top. Because I am hot. If you don't mind putting the fan on, then that'd be fine. Is it hot in anybody else? I'm going to be a sweat. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe I can. I should. Well, it's hot to me. I'm about to. I'm like. I'm like. Sweating. I bring my uh, smock. My, my spirit food smock. You know which one? The red one. Thank you. All right, so what do I do with this? Yes, what I'm going to do as soon as he uh, brings it out, bring, I'll switch it out. Because I'm sitting up here sweating and it's so uncomfortable that I, I just don't want to have it continue like that. So y'all be, uh, do, some, do me a, uh, 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 son, do me a favor. Just go ahead and play some praise and worship music while I change out this top here. Amen, because when he comes back, we will... Uh, I'll change it out. Thank you, Lord. His cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. So what he's saying is, God who is a loving father will always give a instruction to his children to bring them up to a better walk and fellowship with him. Amen. God is not about crushing his children. God is not trying to cause his children to become so depressed from the guilt that they've done wrong that they no longer would choose to fellowship with him. But he wants them to always understand that he wants you to rise up and be the best that you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, verse 13. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Notice, we were happy about you being comforted. 
and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Now, the incident that Paul was referring to in the past was that individual in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the one who had his father's, mom, father's wife. Well, that individual was in error, and Paul gave a judgment call on it by the Holy Ghost, and they followed the instruction that Paul gave. It caused the young man to repent and to get right with God, and therefore, Paul said, you brought forth an obedient response to the word that was given. And that response that you gave, that obedience that you showed, he said, it sure blessed our hearts. Now, because you understand that God is our father, a good father will do what with his children? Correct his children. Now turn over to second, I mean to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Because God loves his children. And he wants his children to always grow up in the right and good way in the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he what? He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And the word scourge there means he's going to straighten you out with the word. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof are, excuse me, all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Now look at verse 8 again. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. In other words, all of God's children are supposed to be partakers of his chastening. Meaning, what's good for one is good for all. So God does not have separate rules for his children. All of his chastisement is for all of his children so that all of his children will walk according to his rule. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Look at verse 9. Furthermore, Let's all read that out loud together. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Notice that he informs us that our Father God is the Father of our spirit. So who is your daddy? God is your father. Amen? God is your daddy. Is he the father of your flesh? No. No. He's the father of your spirit. So he informs us, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh 
which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and what? Mm. And live. So the purpose of his correction for us is that we may what? Live. That we may live. That we may live. And he says, now even your natural father, when they corrected you, you gave them reverence, and they're capable of making mistakes. But God the Father doesn't make any mistakes. He's saying, when I correct you, it's so that you can live and enjoy life in Christ. Amen. Now, verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. Talking about the father of our flesh. Fathers of our flesh. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. So notice he says that the fathers of your flesh, they chastened you after what? After their own pleasure. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, or because of this, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. That means, you know, sometimes people are like, I'm just on, I don't feel like running and jumping and talking and being happy. Well, he said, look, don't let the correction get to you and make you negative. Verse 13, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be what? Healed. Let it rather be healed. Thank you, Lord. Let's all raise our hands and say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. for your healing power you, that comes through your word, yes. that corrects us, that, corrects us. that, instructs, us, that instructs us, that gives us the better way to live, the holy life. In Christ, in Christ is the best life, the best life to, live. to live. In Jesus' name, in Jesus name. amen. Thank you, Jesus. His word corrects. His word heals. His word makes whole. His word brings life and life more abundantly. His word gives us the opportunity to receive the best that he's provided for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we're not to look at his word as something to be considered grievous. But we look at his word as something that we receive with a what? With a heart of receptivity. Because he's the father of our spirits, he has the right to tell us how we're to live. The fathers of our flesh, they did the best that they could in trying to get you to have a, a productive life. But the fathers of your flesh are not to be compared to the father of your spirit because the father of your spirit says, I won't make any mistakes when I'm correcting you. So he talks to us in a manner that gives us a better outlook on life. Amen? Now turn back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. So Paul is happy to see the believers in Corinth receive instruction from the word because it proves that they're going to enjoy more life. They're going to have a better life because when God corrects, he does it for our purpose of receiving a better life. Now verse 13. Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For if 
I have boasted anything to him of you. I am not ashamed, but as we speak all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth, which means I told Titus you all were people who were willing to take instruction and that your walk in the Lord was what you would consider the only way to live. I told Titus that I was thankful for your willingness to study the scriptures and allow the scriptures to be lived out in your life. And then when Titus came and saw how you responded to the word, it blessed Titus' heart. And since it blessed Titus' heart, it blessed my heart. And so Paul was informing us and them and letting all believers know be people who are willing and ready to repent. Turn over to the book of Revelations. See, when you really walk with the Lord, you're willing to what? Repent. When you blow it, you repent. Now, why does he want you to repent when you blow it? So that he can get the goodies to you that he wants you to have. Amen? Amen. So coming to a place of repentance whereby you're willing to say, I'll correct that, Lord. Thank you for showing that to me because you love me so much. I will receive your instruction. I will do your will. And, Lord, we're not going to have to keep going over this over and over and over again. Why? Because, Lord, I recognize your motive for correcting me is for what purpose? It's so that I may what? Live. So that I may live. That I may live. And really, Jesus made that clear. Now, I'm going to look at something here in Corinthians, I mean in Revelations. But turn over to, sec, uh, to uh, John's Gospel. And uh, John's Gospel, the 14th chapter. Look at this. John's Gospel, chapter 14. Because God wants his people to live. He wants you to be prosperous and be blessed. The Lord is not trying to cause his people to walk through their Christian life filled with guilt and looking at themselves as those who have no true fellowship and love with the Father. Okay? So, um, you have John chapter 14? Yes. Good, good. Let's look at this. All right, you can turn that fan off now. Thank you. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by who? But by me. Now turn over to John chapter 10. Verse 10. John 10, 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it, it being life, more what? Abundantly. More abundantly. So Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have life more abundantly. He didn't come to take life away from you. He came to give you life. Amen? Amen. And true life is in him. So when an individual says, I love the Lord, but I'm going to live any way I want to live. Well, no. Life is defined in Christ. Now, turn over to Revelations chapter 21. Revelations chapter 21. Revelations 21, verse 6. And he said unto me, it is done. Got it? Revelations chapter 21, verse 6. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, 
the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8 now. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the what? In the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So it seems to me that he's putting forth correction so that his children won't experience the what? The second death. And the second death is that he's referring to is when an individual does not have Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Yes, physically they die one death, right? But the second death is that they'll be forever away from the life and the nature of God and their spirit and soul is going to go to hell. And hell is going to be what? Taken and placed into the lake of fire. And that's called the second death. And God doesn't want any of his children to come to a place where they're so committed to doing wrong and haven't been corrected that they just start taking their salvation for granted and eventually come to a position of saying, you know what, I really love sin more than I love God, so I'm going to ask the Lord to leave my life and I'll just cling on to the sin thinking that it, it'll be okay and, and uh, it, they won't hurt. Well, there is what's called the second death. And that second death is what? When an individual goes to the what? The lake of fire. Some people say, I can handle hell. Well, you know what? Hell ain't the baddest place. It's the lake of fire. And that lake of fire is no joke. <laughs> okay, so turn over now to Revelations chapter, chapter 3, verse 19. Revelations chapter 3. And we'll look at verse 19. Revelations 3:19. As many as I love, I what? Rebuke. I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Notice as many as I what? Love. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. So he informs us that it's his love for us that causes him to chasten us or to correct us or give us insight from his word and we'll receive it, right, on how to enjoy his best. And, you know, that's comforting to me as a Christian man because as a Christian man, I'm like, I can't come to a place where I can just get so far out on the left whereby I have to wonder what happened to Jesus. Because his shepherd's staff that he has that has the hook on it, <laughs> it draws me back Amen. to say, no, I'm not going to let you get out there. I'm not going to let you get out there without letting you know how far you've gone. See, that's a loving thing. That's a loving father. I, I, I appreciate when a father corrects me. Amen? Amen? And so when my natural father corrected me, he had to show me that things were to go his way instead of my way. Why? Because at the time I was a little tyke or a little toddler or, and a, a young child of five, I wasn't necessarily doing things the right way or the safe way. I remember one time I was, I'd come to the corner of uh, the street upon which we lived. And that corner was a huge, uh, uh, there was a, a, a lot of cars, uh, what was the street called? Venice, Venice Street. Uh, for me with Los Angeles, but anyway, it's a major street, a major thoroughfare. And I, I was on the corner there because across the street was a store. 
And I wanted to go over to the store and get some candy. And I, I stood on the edge of the curb there, and I was getting ready to step off, and there was an elderly gentleman that told me, he said, young boy, you better not get off, step off of there. It's too dangerous out here for you. You're supposed to uh, stay up on the curb and go back home. I looked at him as if to say, sir, you don't know me. I want my candy. And I'm going to go get it too. And so I was kind of, kind of like, you know, I'm still going to go. I don't, I don't know you, and you don't know me. And then he grabbed me and said, "If you step off of that curb there, I'm going to spank you myself, and then I'm going to take you to your parents, and I'm pretty sure they're not going to be happy with you." I looked at him as if to say, what you talking about? You're not going to cramp my style. I went to step off of the curb there. He snatched me up, wore my little bottom out. Yes, he did. And then while I'm crying, he took me to my parents. I didn't even know he knew my parents. <laughs> Well, needless to say, when he knocked on the door of my apartment, of my parents' apartment at that time, they, uh, they saw me crying, him holding on to me, and he proceeded to tell them all that transpired. Well, you know what else I was looking forward to, huh? <laughs> Another spanking. <laughs> Why? Because... The man's instruction to me was right. He wanted me to live and not end up being a casualty on the road. My parents knew that he was right and they enforced what he had told me because even though I was their child, he still was telling me something that would allow me to remain their child for a long time. And I wasn't willing to listen to him, and so the man spanked me, and in a sense, he acted as a father of the flesh, didn't he? But he only did what my natural father would do, and my father did. <laughs> now, when I think about that, I think about, wow, what type of mindset did I have when I was a child? I was strong-willed. I was unwilling to listen to his warning. He tried to warn me. I wasn't trying to hear him. And I used to go to the store with my grandmother and my brother. And then I remember one time I had stolen some candy. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was wrong because I wasn't letting anybody know about it. I had it. I snuck it and put it away. You know what I mean? And then every now and then I'd go into my little stash and I'd grab me a little candy and eat it. And my brother happened to see me chew it on some candy. He says, well, what you eating? I says, what you need to know for? I guess I was a smart little kid. Sarcastic. He said to me, he said, um, what are you eating on? Show me what you're eating on. And I showed him. I said, I got a piece of candy. He said, well, let me have some. I says, well, no. <laughs> He said, where'd you get it from? I said, don't you worry about it. I tell you, I have a little smart mouth. <laughs> well, needless to say, he went and squealed on me, told. And when he did, my grandmother, who would normally take us to the store, she said, uh, what are you eating? And I told her. She said, where'd you get it from? I said, if I got it from the store. She said, um, I didn't buy you that candy. No, you didn't. Well, then how did you pay for it? Well, she's asking me way too many questions, but I dare not, not answer. She said, you stole it, didn't you? I said, yes, ma'am, I did. Well, she proceeded to take me back to the store. And I went to the proprietor of the store there, and I told him that I'd stolen, and I did apologize, and I offered to pay for it because she gave me the money to pay for it. But then she said, uh, you know, he's, don't be concerned about him talking to the owner of the store. Don't be concerned about it because he won't be stealing anymore. <laughs> and she took me back to the house, to the apartment, 
and proceeded to administer correction. <laughs> See, I grew up with people that were willing to correct you when you're wrong. Are you listening? People who loved me enough to say, you're out of order, and your out of order behavior will not be tolerated. See, it's good to be in an environment like that. Even though it may not appear to be what? It may not appear to be comfortable because now you got to watch what you say and do. But praise be unto God how it helps and how it causes you to live and be blessed. Amen? Amen. So that's why the Bible talks about watch the company you keep. Turn to the book of Proverbs. See, people who don't want to be corrected, if, if when we talk about Christians, they won't listen to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Why? Because the Apostle Paul was anointed and he was given a responsibility to encourage believers and to cause their faith to grow. But in order for that to happen, a person would have to have the attitude towards him. Turn to Proverbs chapter 13. Your attitude towards him would be, I'm glad to be in the company of a man who loves God. Are you listening? I'm glad to be around people who love God. God, because people who love God will have a attitude of protection and life and longevity and joy of life with you and for you. Yes. They're not going to watch you walk off the cliff. They're not going to encourage you to drop into the hole. Are you with me? So godly company is a benefit. Now notice in chapter 13 of Proverbs, verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be what? Shall be destroyed. See, some people aren't getting into trouble because they're directly stealing or doing something wrong. You understand? In other words, they didn't commit the crime. But if you're driving the car and your partner or friend goes in the bank and the alarm goes off and they get in the back of the car and tell you to drive on, you must understand you are now going to be in trouble. I remember not seeing too long ago, I, I saw this not too long ago, there was a boy, a man who had robbed a bank. He's driving around and his girlfriend wasn't in the car. She was like on another block, about a block away from the bank robbery. She's yelling and screaming for him to come get her. The police are chasing him around the city and then... <clears throat> And then he pulls up in front and she jumps in the car while the police are chasing him. And you know what happens. Now she's what? She's a party to the crime. Now that's stupidity. That's ignorance gone to seed. You know, that means to produce more ignorance. She was clear from the crime. She jumped in the crime. Wow. That's foolishness. Why? Because she had a foolish person whom she called herself being in love with. And she wasn't logical at all. And the thing about it is, all of this was being shown on the, like the, the news report. And you could see it. It was a helicopter filming the whole thing that's going on. It was live. And this woman was free until she jumped in the car to be with him <laughs> while the police were chasing him. 
Proverbs 13, verse 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be what? Wise. Shall be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. This is the reason why I love to be around wise people and I love wise people to be around me. I'm not going to let you get into trouble if we're together. You won't get a parking ticket. You won't get a speeding ticket. You won't get into trouble if you're with me. Because I love you enough to, got, to watch your back. You understand what I mean by that? To watch your back. But a person who has a companion that is a fool will be encouraged to do wrong. Or they'll go and do wrong and bring wrong to you and make you a part of the wrong that they did. Get in the car with drugs. Stash it underneath the seat when the police turn on the lights. And you happen to be the one driving. And they say, well, I don't know anything about drugs. And then the police search the car. Well, whose drugs are these? And the person that was the passenger says, I don't know. So therefore, they lay what? The drug charge on the person doing the driving because that's your car. Now, the person doing the driving says, but I didn't put those drugs there. I didn't do that. I don't do drugs. Well, were you with a person who you know does drugs? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not going to squeal. But see, now you have an allegiance to a person who is in error, which says whatever error they're in, you're going to now suffer with them because you are a part of their foolishness. So you're going to catch a case just because you have an allegiance to a fool. And I went and visited a person in jail not too long ago that something like that happened. More than, in fact, more than one person. And my attitude to them was, are you learning your lesson in that a companion of fools shall be destroyed? You know, you wouldn't be behind bars. I'm talking to them now, through the glass. I've got the phone to my ear. See, some people don't know what I do when I'm not here. I'm letting the person know. I said, do you know how you got behind the glass? How did you got in prison here? Yeah, I know. But let's look at this scripture here, and I'll just go over the scripture with him, and I'll say, now don't you become a companion of fools while you're in jail. Get in the Bible studies that they have there. I know they have them because I know the chaplain. And get a Bible. Because they won't let me bring a Bible. You got to, right, minister me, bang. We go and visit people in, in jails and so forth. So you got to get a chaplain approved Bible. And they do have Bible studies and they do have prayer time. And they do allow people to grow spiritually in jail. But now if a person's in jail and chooses to be around foolish people, what's going to happen? They're going to increase their time, more than likely, get caught up in some problems, and then have more foolishness to display when they get out of jail. Are you with me? So uh, let's all read that verse of scripture out loud in verse 20. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. That sounds so good, I think we need to read it again. <laughs> he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Now turn over to Psalms, the book of Psalms. Psalms, the first division of Psalms. Paul the Apostle, when he was writing to the believers in Corinth, he was letting them know, your obedience to my instruction, bless my heart. I'm thrilled because you've chosen to listen and not ignore. Psalms 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the what? ungodly. 
I thought that, that sounds pretty much like Proverbs, doesn't it? Blessed is the man that walketh not. Circle the word walk. That walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. If I know you are prone to take drugs, I'm not putting you in my car and we rolling down the street. Why? Because you may have something on you and the police just happen to stop the car. And here I am caught catching a case. And there are certain types of drugs that people take that causes them to have different type of behavior. You understand? And you can catch a case not because you're a drug addict, but because you're with a drug addict. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And it's interesting that ungodly people always have some advice they want to give. <laughs> they always know what they know, which is ungodly advice, but they are adamant about giving it. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor what? Sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Notice how it goes from walking to standing to sitting down. Wow. Having lunch. Nice. Having dinner or breakfast with a person who you know is ungodly. So it's not that you're doing the deeds of the ungodly you just have ungodly people around you that's going to take its toll on you so don't have ungodly people that you choose to fellowship with isn't that a blessing and then he tells us what do you mean uh, isn't that a blessing I'm talking about isn't it a blessing to be warned about this amen so that we don't allow ourselves to be caught up in some mess. One thing for sure, while we're in here right now, we don't have an opportunity to be caught into, up into some problems or difficulties with those who are engaging in wrongdoing. Because there's no wrongdoing going on in here. Amen. Now, how many of you remember Reginald Denny? Remember Reginald Denny? He was the guy that it, um, during the... Um, King riots he pulled the guy out of the truck and started uh, and hit him in the head and all that kind of stuff started stomping him and whatnot. Well, I worked just down the street when that whole thing went down. And I was leaving the office that day and I was headed toward that, that very same intersection where foolishness was getting ready to take place. And as I was driving towards Florence there, right, I noticed that the police were going in the opposite direction of where the crowd was coming to get a little rowdy. And you know what I did? I just said, hmm, hmm, hmm. no, I didn't. <laughs> I stopped, considered the matter, and did a U-turn and left. I went in the direction where the police were going, away from the mess. <laughs> Why? Because a wise man perceives what's coming down the road. A fool just Oh, 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 gets knocked in the head and gets taken advantage of and wonders why their life is difficult. Are you with me? And that's in the Proverbs. Find that scripture for me where a wise man looks ahead and a fool doesn't see it coming. Just doesn't, doesn't have a, a way to look for it. Now here's what my... Um, my encouragement is, in that, there, that's in Proverbs, but there's another scripture in Proverbs I'm going to have you turn to as well. Proverbs, let's look at Proverbs chapter 1, and then Minister McBain, if you'll find that, or, um, or Minister Michelle, if you'll find that for me. Okay. Proverbs chapter 1. Okay, you ready? Proverbs chapter 1. Ready? Okay. Notice in verse 20 of Proverbs chapter 1. 
Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn ye at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, and ye refuse. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would, not, and would none of my reproof. Proverbs chapter 1. Oh, you have the scripture that I was referring to. Proverbs what? Pro no, that's not the one. Good one, no, but not the one. Okay. Okay. Um, no, that there, a fool will just not perceive the trouble that is ahead. Okay. A fool will not perceive the trouble that is ahead, but a wise man will anticipate or see it and not go in that direction. It's like a, a wise man doesn't walk down a dark alley at night with money sticking out of their pocket. But a fool will, right? Okay, so Proverbs chapter 1, and we'll find that verse of Scripture that I was referring to. Verse 26, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge. And did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. See what God is saying there? See, a person who just chooses to be ignorant of the word, a person who chooses to turn away from God's word, chooses to turn away from the fellowship of wise individuals who delight in the word of God. Those individuals that make choices to turn away from God's word are really turning to ignorance. See that? And individuals that choose to be ignorant of the word are going to suffer. Because ignorant people get into trouble. And if you're around ignorant people and you fellowship with ignorant people, then guess what's going to happen? Because ignorance is a curable condition. And there are individuals that refuse to do something about it. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because they've rejected knowledge, God said, they can't be priests unto me. And I've got to reject their children. Why, Lord? Do you hate their children? No, I love children. I love generations of children. But because an individual chooses not to learn my ways, they're going to be teachers of ignorance. And ignorant people teach ignorance. Ignorance can be taught. Hmm. So an ignorant parent can teach ignorance to their children. Right? Like drink responsibly. Gamble responsibly. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Proverbs chapter 1. Um, Proverbs 14, 8 in the Living Bible says, The wise man looks ahead, the fool attempts to fool himself, and won't face facts. Ah, okay. What is that again? Proverbs 14, 8. But that was the Living Bible. Proverbs 8, 14? No, 14, 8. 14, 8. I believe that may be the scripture. Proverbs 14, 8. Proverbs 14, 8. Yes, this is it. I believe this is it. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of, it, of fools is deceit. Well, that's close. That's not the one. That's close, though. The way she read it sounded great. 
<laughs> now I got all excited about it because that's a good one. That's a good translation. That's a living translation. I like that. That's really good. So maybe I heard it or read it in a different translation. Okay, but I'll know for sure when we come back. Because <laughs> I'm going res to research it out. <laughs> but your concordance? I have my concordance. Yes. Yes. Certainly. I love it. Thank you. Give me a key phrase again. Uh, a fool. Just look under the word fool. <laughs> it's in Proverbs. So <laughs> that's a lot of references in the book of in the concordance, amen. Although that's this is really good. All right. Now we're looking at Proverbs chapter one. Turn back to Proverbs chapter one. Because we're seeing how that God loves to correct his children so that his children won't get into trouble. And this is one of the reasons why when we talk about having a fear for God, a reverence for God, right? When you understand that he loves you enough, he's not going to let you just walk into hell. He's not going to let you just turn from Jesus. Some people say, I may be saved, I may not be saved. I'll tell you what, because, I mean, I've cut up so much. No, no, no. You can't accidentally end up outside of Christ. Are you with me? person has to make a decision to get out of Christ once they've been in Christ. All right, Proverbs chapter 1, and I'll just read verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. See that? So a fool will despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us look privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, Walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the openings of the gates in the city, she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And we read this before. And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. You see the central theme there? A person who hates knowledge, hates the knowledge of God's word, is setting themselves up for destruction. That's one of the reasons why I am so adamant about when a person says, well, we need to see you. Sure you can see me. I'll see you at church. I'll see you at church. Well, I don't go to church. But then you can't see me. 
Now, may I give you all just a little insight here? You don't know, mind. I've been doing this all night. It's kind of a unique night, isn't it? But listen to this. There was a man by the name of Lynn who was a barber. And I went, I found out about him, and I sat in his barber chair. And I mean a gifted individual, could cut hair very well, artistic in a, say, in a sense, very gifted. And I would talk to him about his abilities and so forth, and then he would talk about how he knew that God had blessed him, but he wouldn't accept Jesus. And I told him, I said, Lynn, every time I sit in your chair, do you know I'm always preaching Jesus? He said, yes. I said, well, why don't you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Why don't you do that? He said, well, I will one day, but I'm not ready right now. I said, don't you know the pressure is on you every time I sit in your seat because I'm always going to be talking to you about accepting Jesus? He said, yeah, I know. <clears throat> anyway, he ended up getting fired from the place where he was because he got drunk. And the owner of the, <clears throat> of the salon said to him, uh, I, don't, I don't want barbershop. She said, I, I, I don't want you here anymore. And he called me up and said, well, would you pray for me so that I can get my job back? I says, I will, but you understand the reason you're in this situation is because you're rejecting knowledge. He said, well, pray for me, please. And I did, and he got his job back. Now, <clears throat> he's doing well, but he hadn't given his life over to Jesus yet. A few months later, he ends up getting fired again, asked not to come back into the shop. He calls me up, and I'm at my house, and uh, when I answered the phone there, he says, this is Lynn that's on the line here. He says, you know, I don't work at the shop there anymore, so what I'd like for you to do, would you be so kind as to come to my house, and I'll cut your hair at my house? I said to him, Lynn, I said, um, just a moment. Now, he was studying um, uh, laser guided surgery and that type of stuff. I mean, a brilliant, had a mind that was very, very intelligent, but he was just a person who didn't want to come to Jesus. He had, um, he had, like I said, very skilled hands that can do all kinds of things. And so when I took the phone away from my ear, I said, Lord, what do you say about it? The Lord said, ask him, is he going to receive me as his savior? And I put the phone in my ear and I says, Lynn, are you going to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord? He says, no, not just yet. I will one day. I said, well, then, Lynn, I can't come to your house. A few days later, I get a call from his sister. She's at Cedar sinai Hospital. Wow. And she says, are you Pastor Ziegler? And I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, I need you to come here to the hospital, please, at Cedar sinai Lynn is asking for you to come. I said, why is he in there? She, she said, he was shot four times with a 30-odd six rifle. <coughs> now, my father had a 30-odd six hunting rifle. The bullets on that thing are about like this. So I get to the hospital there, and Lynn's in, the, of course, in a bad shape. His sister, um, she, she just, when she saw me, she said, thank you for coming, and then Lynn wants to talk with you. And I started talking with him, and I found out he had both of his hands blown off now. Now, how's he going to make a living with his hands blown off? He got shot in the shoulder. They took, the, the bullet took out this part of his shoulder, and the bullet also, he got shot also in the ribs. And the, the bullet just took out a gash of, of, uh, of part of his, his torso area here and, got, and got, took off his shoulder area here, right in here, and then it took off both of his hands. And one hand was completely gone. The other hand, they tried to reconstruct it, and they've got it in some kind of metal apparatus to just to try to give him something to look at. I said to him, I said, Lynn, you know, you didn't have to be here, but this is not to belabor the fact. I said, Lynn, are you willing to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior now? I said, you could have been killed. He said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He said, I prayed with my sister. I got, I'm, 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 I'm with the Lord now. Now, here's what I'm getting at. The way he came about... And I, I, I'm just, y'all don't mind if I tell you what this details of the story. He was an elderly gentleman, but he was very talented and very gifted. And uh, he was taking uh, younger people, you know, when I say people, females, to entertainment at the house that he was in. 
And one of, and the house that he was in was kind of an elaborate house. A woman, a wealthy woman, had a big home, and she kind of liked him because she was an elderly wealthy woman and she said well you just come stay at my house then I understand you're trying to get back on your feet or whatever the case may be and she also extended some help to another man who had just gotten out of jail he was a ex-con well the ex-con was a younger individual and he saw how this older guy who's supposed to know better was taking these younger women to bed and he said you know, you know what you're an old guy you ought to know better than this and so in his ex-convict mentality went and got a 30 odd six hunting rifle and shot him four times and he intended to kill him are you listening now what if I'd have been at the house when all that shooting started are you listening I wasn't at the house because God told me not to go but the shooting took place at the house and I'm one who's inclined to get my hair cut regularly because I have to be before people often. And I sure wouldn't have wanted to be there, being at the wrong place at the wrong time. See, some people don't make decisions on the basis of the Bible. They make decisions on the basis of feelings. Okay. Are you listening? Well, I like this individual, Lord. Well, you can't like that individual more than God likes him. You can't love an individual more than God loves them. God gave them breath to breathe and put them in their mother's womb and brought them out. How can you love somebody more than God loves them? Amen? Amen. So then even if it appears to be a remorseful thing, if something that makes you sorry to hear that you can't be around people who are practicing doing wrong, who are just not listening to the truth of the gospel and you're like but I like them Lord I really like them Lord I don't want to just give that up and the Lord is saying look do you want to be in a situation that you can't actually ask for help because if I'd have been over there when Lynn was getting shot I may have been shot too and I'm not doing anything wrong I'm not taking women to bed I'm not, I'm not doing anything wrong but I am doing something wrong if I went over there and was doing what God told me not to do. Are you with me? So you've got to do what God tells you to do. And if you'll do what God tells you to do, you'll find that blessings will flow. Because if you're willing and obedient, what does the scripture say in Isaiah 119? You'll eat the good of the land. Did y'all find that verse of scripture I was looking for? Okay. Go ahead and read it out loud. A prudent person sees trouble coming and ducks. Yes. A simpleton walks in blindly and is awkward. Is that the same scripture that we she gave us? Proverbs fourteen eight. No, um, no. This is in Proverbs twenty two three. King James says. Proverbs 22, 3. three. Proverbs, turn over. I believe that's the one. Proverbs 22, 3. But we also saw the other one that was good as well. Proverbs 22, 3. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's the one I was looking for. Proverbs 22, verse 3. It says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are what? And are punished. Underline that, commit that. There's also Proverbs 13, 20. 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 Well, I mean, because you've been spending time in the Word, the Word of God causes you to have insight and perception. See that? You can determine where a person is going to go down the road. You know where they're going to end up. And you don't have to be there when they get there. You can know it just because of what they're doing. You don't, you don't have to have a person to point a gun at you to know that a person walking around flailing a gun, brandishing a gun, and shooting anywhere, that that person could possibly do damage to you. You don't have to be in, in the midst of that, do you? 
Now, you can see what that individual is doing, and you do what? Duck. Get out of the way. Call the police. Lock the door. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are what? And are punished. Punished. Wow. So Paul warned the believers at Corinth. Why? Because he already knew where that young man was going to end up if he didn't change his ways. And then he was happy with the believers at Corinth that obeyed the instruction because their obedience to the instruction did what? It caused the young man to experience the pain and of, of, of excommunication. He experienced what it was like to be on his own. He was outside of the fellowship of the family of God, and he came to the conclusion, there is no fun out here outside of people that are praying and doing the right by God. And so he repented and came back. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he said, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be Satan in the day of Christ Jesus. What do you mean? That he will not experience the second death. Let his flesh go ahead and get destroyed because the devil is going to pay him for the wages of sin is death or dying early. But he didn't have to die early if he just what? If he just obey. See, some Christians just will not learn the easy way. But when you're no longer protecting them <laughs> and praying for them in the sense of, you know what? I know you don't want to do right. I'm just going to pray for you. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. You're going to have to ask the Lord how to pray. How to pray. Paul was saying, let, if, he has, if that young man has to die, let him die while he still has a confession of faith of Jesus. Because he could get to the point where he loves sin so much that he'll say, I'd rather cling to sin and let go of Jesus. I know that may be a hard pill for people to take or receive, but it is so. Because you used your will to come to Christ and you can use your will to get out of Christ. Turn over to Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Wow. Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews, chapter. Hebrews the sixth chapter. Is this helping anybody? Amen. Is this helping you to see how not to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? Amen. Trying to do the right thing? <laughs> Don't be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Don't be around a fool that refuses to change. Well, you don't come around me anymore. We friends. Well, we're not friends anymore. My friendship is based upon who walking with Jesus. Well, I need to see you. Good. You can see me at church. Come to church. Hebrews 6 verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat, or able for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is what? Yes. Is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. Whose end is to be burned. There are individuals that just do not have any fear for God. 
And I know it seems like, well, oh, Christian, is that possible for an individual to love sin more than they love God? Is it possible for a sinner to love God more than sin? I'll say that again. Is it possible for one who is not in the family of God to come to a place where they say, I will obey God more than sin? Yes. yes. Well, how come you don't have a problem accepting a person's will to decide their future in Christ on that side? But now as a Christian, an individual, you think, is just now they, they cannot decide to do wrong and go after sin? Oh, yes, they can. And choose to hold on to sin more than God? Yes, they can. Didn't he say that it's possible? Yes, he did. But that's not something that happens easily. It doesn't happen easily. Meaning that the person has to have a certain level of maturity. You've got to have an experience with the Holy Ghost. And uh, a one, look at that. You see the, 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 the criteria there? Verse 3. And this is what we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. See that? Well, can a mature Christian reject Jesus? Certainly they can. Well, well, well what is it, what's going to happen if they reject Jesus? There's no, more, there's no more salvation offered to them. Because God can't offer them any more than what they've already what? What they've already had and experienced. So a person says, well, you know what, I, I rejected Jesus, I rejected Jesus, oh, I'm, I'm doomed. No, no, no. If you did, you wouldn't even be crying about it. You wouldn't have any bother about it at all. You'd just be just as cold and, and, and no feeling, no emotion, no, res no response at all. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is not even going to woo you into fellowship with God anymore. Now, a sinner, the Holy Ghost will deal with them about what's coming up, right? So that a sinner could come to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. But if, it, let's say, for example, a person who's walked in the power of the Holy Ghost, gifts of the Spirit, knows the Word of God, experienced doing the will of God, acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior of their life, and has brought people to the Lord and has grown up in the Lord may even have others who have been brought to the Lord by them, right? Then that individual says, well, I'm tired of Jesus now. I don't want him anymore in my life. There ain't nothing you can do for that person. Did you hear what I said? If Dr. Price said, I'm through with Jesus, it ain't no sense in you praying for him. I can't even reject Jesus and have you pray for me. There's nothing for you to pray about. Are y'all listening? Yes. Now, a baby Christian that stubs their toe, makes a mistake, goes out and repeats and gets into sin because they don't know how to walk in a mature way in the Lord, that individual, you pray for them. You, with your spiritual, restore such a one of the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Do you understand that? Yeah, a baby Christian's got to grow up in the Lord. But a fully mature Christian in the Lord that rejects Jesus, there is nothing you can do for them. Is that clear? And he said in the last days there will be people that will do that. Denying the very Lord that purchased them and washed them with his own blood. There are individuals that will be doing that. How they can do it? But see, in the last days, darkness shall come upon the earth and gross darkness to people. How many of you learned something tonight? To God be the glory for the wisdom. Amen? Amen. Stay with the word. Amen? Amen? Continue in the word and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Enjoy life. Enjoy the blessings that Christ came to give you. Every head bowed and every eye. Salvation is the free gift.
that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy, but you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father, and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, and thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spirit Food Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you, be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible declares, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you, be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www.myspiritfood.com. Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.